Hi. So I'm Arjen Lenz. I'm, um, I used to be my scroll. I'm no longer. Um, and for a couple of years, I've done. Let's see if I can make this work now. Um, I've learned since this morning. I now run a browser in the VM, so I don't have to switch anymore. Yeah, good. Huh? <laughs> so now if I do that, yeah. And I've even there you go. I've even hidden the fact that I'm running Mac now. It's pure full screen. Thank you, Sun Virtual Box. Ubuntu. Um, so, there. I, I run Open Query, which does um, training and support subscriptions per hour. Um, one of the things we also do is uh, who hasn't been to any of the R Delta talks yet? A couple. Okay, quick rundown again. That's okay. Um, that's not the one. Let's show it in here. Is it well readable, by the way? I'll make sure the font size is enhanced every time. Being inside the VM doesn't make the networking quicker, of course. So, what is our delta? Our delta is essentially a distro of MySQL. We grab the MySQL source code, we add a number of patches, we package it up, not just as a tarball, but we actually build um, decent RPMs for Red Hat and CentOS, and we build Ubuntu and Debian packages. And outside the Ubuntu and Debian distros, there are no actual third-party packages available. If you go to the MySQL website, you can't download MySQL Community Edition from there um, as a Debian package. So this is actually the only place where you can actually get a package. Um, we use the the Debian D package information as a basis for what we are doing. So essentially getting a superset of what you already had in Debian or what you already had in Ubuntu. Um, you're not actually losing any of their patches and the file names are exactly the same. You can actually pretend that our Delta is an upgrade to your existing install and it will work. Um, to give you a quick overview of how you would install the Debian foo. And essentially the Ubuntu stuff is the same thing. You would have to add the, uh, the GPG key that our Delta uses to sign the um, to sign the um, the packages and get either this one or this one. At the moment, we're only Edge, and we're going to do the, the new one as well. Um, this is the plain version of our Delta, and there's an our Delta sale, which is essentially the bleeding edge version of our Delta. So there can be pa some patches in there that are not yet stable, just as experimental. So it's something you would run on the development server, but definitely not in production unless you're really, really in deep trouble with performance and you would try anything to keep your business alive. Then you would run that. Um, and yes, some people do run that kind of stuff in, in production. It depends on the, the need that you have, obviously. If it's a choice between being in business or not, you would try. And overall, that does go really well, but naturally, those systems are so unique in what they do that there's no predicting on whether any unknown bugs might pop up. So that's, uh, that's always an issue. So um, the patches that we have are quite diverse. There's three main categories. Um, one is instrumentation. We can see more about what's going on inside the server and for individual queries. We get more statistical information and, and, and so on. Um, we were playing with that this morning. Um, let's see if I still have that on the screen. Maybe not. Let me, hmm. control shift T. I'm used to the Mac key, so being inside an Ubuntu VM from my Mac confuses me. Um, that's the one. Okay, so. Oh, hang on. Oh, yes. Okay, this will give you an idea of what's, what's actually going on. Um, 
usual query information, except here we're getting microsecond granularity. Um, that's not necessarily useful in development, but if you're in production, many queries actually take shorter than a second, and it's just nice to know which ones are slower than others. Because once you've actually dealt with all slow queries that take longer than a second, you might want an enhanced granularity in microseconds. It's just the next um, step. So you can now specify in this particular uh, these patches, you can specify microseconds in a fraction of a second like that. Uh, you can see how much lock time there was, but also things like full scan. That means that no index was used for um, the first table in this particular query. You can get that out of show status, but you would have to run it immediately after running the query. And you would also have to run a show status before the query to actually tell what the difference is before and after in those statistics. So this line is part of the extra instrumentation. This line is part of the extra instrumentation. This talks about sorting operations and temporary tables. Um, again, you can get it out of status, but for an individual query, it's just tricky to get it out. It costs you extra queries. Here you get it for free, and it gives some extra information about InnoDB. You can filter what you get. You can actually um, say, okay, I only want to know about full table scans. I only want to know when an index is not getting used, and the system can actually do that for you with, with a couple of options. That is in the, um, when you go to the iDelta site and to click on documentation, it's actually documentation on the patches. So, that gives you a basic idea of what kind of stuff we're looking at, and now we'll actually look at the code and the infrastructure, because that's, I think, what you're here for. So, so this is a list of the patches that we have. This is somewhat incomplete since more, more have come up since, but it gives you a basic idea, and each of these has a link to the corresponding documentation as well. It shows their origin, which is often Percona or Google. Um, Yasufumi Kinoshita and Baron Schwartz actually also work for Percona, so you can see how this is turning into a bit of a Percona party. Um, by the way, Percona eh, are essentially kind of competition colleagues of mine in the US, um, former colleagues, and um, they have been very, very busy. Um, one of the things that Baron Schwartz has built is this thing, Matkit. Who here knows Matkit? No one? You really want to have a look at it. Um, look up matkit.org, M-A-A-T-K-I-T.org. Um, it's a bunch of Perl scripts, and it actually gives you information, uh, for instance, about uh, how replication is doing. You can actually check uh, whether two replications or two servers are actually in sync. If they're not, you can actually have the Matkit Toolkit synchronize tables. So it can actually create insert statements and delete statements to put the other side in sync again. It can generate that for you. Um, so that's pretty cool. It is pretty much rocket science. It's good. <laughs> yes. See to sit down? Oh, okay. Um, I'll stay put. And other things it can do, um, it can show the explain select statement in a slightly different structure in text graph on your screen which gives you a bit of an idea about how queries get executed. And there's a whole range of tools, and it's quite, um, quite good. Um, I'll briefly show the URL, just in case you didn't get it. It's there. And it also shows that I'm not afraid of showing my competitive URLs, because um, I think Percona's, Percona's up there as well. Um, Percona mainly deals with companies like Facebook and so on in the US, um, and I also deal with smaller fry because I'm slightly cheaper than they are. Okay, so now you know who Percona is. This is where our Delta lives. It lives on Launchpad, and it means that we use Bazaar BZR for our revision control, which rocks. It is distributed, it just works properly. Um, I have never actually properly been a, a CVS or an SVN user. Um, I've been forced into using SVN for some, some things that I need to participate in but I've never been a uh, CVS user, really, and um, I was actually introduced to with proper version control at MySQL, and at the time we were using BitKeeper before it turned completely evil. Um, next to the Linux kernel, MySQL was essentially the poster boy for um, usage of BitKeeper, and thank goodness MySQL actually moved away from using BitKeeper last year, and it moved to, to Launchpad with Bazaar, and it works extremely well. It is in many ways better than BitKeeper, um, ever was. Um, 
some of the little tools are still in need of a little bit of help, but for the basic functionality, emerging and stuff is already already better. So, what do we see on Launchpad? Um, this is the main page for the Adelta project, and projects are on launchpad.net slash the project name. There's a group that maintains the um, this project, and that's essentially everybody who wants to join. So if you go there, and I just need to see that I actually press the right buttons. No, that mustn't be the one. There. Um, let's just go there and see who's in. So I'm giving some metadata, meta information about the project so you actually get an image of what, we, what what's going on. There we go. Um, I can join the team, show all team members. I mean, I'm not, I'm not actually logged in, so this is the same picture that you would get. So this is a list of people who have decided to join the mailing list. Yeah. So it's it's this group um, that has certain rights in the project, but it also encompasses a mailing list. So when you join this, you also automatically get connected to the mailing list uh, of our Delta developers. And you can see here there's one pending member. It just means that I need to log in from my other browser and actually approve them or one of the other admins of the of the system. Um, these people are administrators, and there's three listed there. And the third one is a Delta Core, which I'll show you now. And our Delta Core is there. We'll get there, show all team members. Okay, um, Anthony Curtis is, I'll call him my personal guru. Um, he used to work for MySQL, he now works at Google, um, but he knows a heck of a lot about the server and he actually wrote quite significant bits. Um, much of the 5.1 plugin architecture is actually his, in terms of code, um, and overall it works rather well. Uh, that's me. Cafuego is actually Peter Lieverding, whom you might know. He runs around here as well. Um, Eric Bergen um, is co-owner of a company in the U.S. called Proven Scaling, and he does um, MySQL consulting as well. Mark Callahan is pretty much the head of the, the, the database, uh, the MySQL database gang at Google. Uh, they have about 10 people hacking on MySQL at Google. Um, in case you didn't know, Google's AdWords and AdSense runs on MySQL. So 95%, no, 97% of their revenue runs through MySQL in terms of billing. So if anybody ever asks you, does MySQL scale and can you actually run a business on it? Well, they're doing it and they don't think they're the smallest company on the planet. Vadim Tachenko, um, another former colleague of mine, he is one of the founders of Percona, the consulting company in the US. So that gives you an idea about the core. Um, if you do a significant amount of work for our Delta, we can just add you there. Simple as that. Based on merit, not um, how much money you put in or whatever. Essentially, our Delta runs with a zero budget. We just put in a little bit of work as time requires. So what are we using um, Launchpad for? It gives some basic information, some announcements, um, and so on. And as you can see here with developer, um, there is some little bit of an informational text. Um, there's an image for those people who have said approximately where they are in the world. You can actually see where they are. You can see there's a couple in Australia, some in Europe, and some in the US. And what else can we see? Um, one of the things we can see, for instance, is the bug system. So we don't need to run our separate bugzilla because our Delta um, just uses Launchpad, and Launchpad has a complete bug tracking system built in. There we go, provides a nice graph, it, uh, it shows the tags, filters, and so on. I can see exactly what is going on. So someone um, listed a bug there, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's Peter Lieverdink who did that. And there you go. So he's tried to compile 5075 um, on the, uh, with the Idelta patches and finds out that that patch doesn't apply to that particular version. So the, we need to check where the patch fails and adapt it. We'll look at that in a moment, see if we can actually fix that possibly. I probably don't have 575 on this laptop, but I'll show you conceptually what that is like. Now, if I were logged in, I could actually change the status to confirmed when I find out that it is actually confirmed. Um, a particular bizarre branch that deals with this bug can be linked to this bug. 
So then when you look at this bug, you can actually look at the branch that goes with it and you can actually find the particular patch and just look at it on the screen or you can just cut and paste and, and get that particular branch in your, on your own system. Um, you can update things, you can add comments, um, there can be security um, reports and you can actually link to other bug systems upstream including the MySQL bug system. So a bug that we find may actually also affect MySQL. Now if we fix it, it's important that that gets linked through to MySQL and also if there's an update on the MySQL end, we would like to know about it. So what Launchpad is specifically for is not trying to centralize everything to Launchpad, but anything that might be happening external to Launchpad that relates to, launch, that relates to the projects actually gets picked up as well and, and bidirectionally exchanged. But let's look at the code, because that's partially what you're here for. Okay, so the main branch is called trunk, and then there's individual trees. I should have actually done that differently, sorry. I need to go back and open this separately there. There we go. So this is what we call the mature main line. So patches that have been, been looked at and we know that they're all good and, and, and so on and our build process is tested, then we put that into the trunk. So that's what we build from. When we do a build, we actually tag, um, we tag this branch with the specific version number of MySQL that we're building, including the patch um, revision that of our delta that we put in there. So if you grab that particular revision of your bazaar tree, you can actually recreate exactly what we did. It's 100% reproducible. We just test it that way. Um, it's nice to be predictable and reproducible. That means that everything actually works properly. So you can, if you want, browse particular, um, let's see. Here we go, patch line offsets are always fun. So I'll look at a particular revision here. You can just pretty much browse the entire revisions, um, all the revisions of the tree as well as the particular changes online. So in this revision, these files were changed and we're getting a side-by-side -side colored diff of the result. I don't know if this is all readable, but it, it gives you a good impression of what Launchpad actually does for you, which is quite neat. Okay, so this is actually merged between a couple of branches, so it looks a bit more complicated than perhaps it is. Um, in any case, it does work. Um, and this is actually an interesting example, line offsets change. So between versions of MySQL, of course, other code gets put in, and that means that the line offsets change within the file where the patch needs to be applied. Now, patch does that automatically, um, but if at some point someone puts in a bit of code within three lines either side of where our patches are, then um, patch may fail. And that is probably what happened to 5R75. It, became too, it came too close. Um, it, that happens mainly in the parser, and we'll get to that in a moment. Yes? What's that, sorry? Yes. Yes, there's another way to do this. Um, well, like I mentioned, we're not, we're not a fork, nor do we want to be. There's one way to deal with this, and that would be to actually pre-patch everything, just maintain that, and pull in the changes that MySQL makes. Um, that's potentially very dangerous because in some cases we are making significant changes and we'd rather have the patch fail. Plus, we like to keep the patch separate because in some cases other functionality, functionality may come up and we might want to remove the entire patch. Um, but there is a better way to do it. We don't quite have the tool set at the moment to do it, but I'll, I will tell you what, what's the better way. So I'll show you in a moment how we actually apply the patches. We use Quilt which is used by, by, by kernel developers, and they, they apply thousands of patches. We only have a couple of dozen. That works in principle. Um, there's two problems. It creates interdependencies between the patches. In some cases, we have to apply one patch before another because they're within range of those few lines. 
we could reduce the number of context lines, but of course that makes things dangerous. We don't want to live dangerously. This is a database server, right? Um, three, three rows of context is generally enough, so we keep it at that, but we don't want to mess with it on that level. Now, like Quilt, Bazaar has infrastructure to do, um, to deal with kind of patch sets, and it's called Loom. And you can Loomify a BZR tree, and that means that the changes are actually in separate tips, separate branches inside the same Bazaar tree. This is all wonderful, but at the moment, there's no instrumentation to get our set of patches to Loomify into those tips and back into patches again. So we need to start in the end, and the middle is perfect. I've talked to the Bazaar developers uh, in, when they had their, um, I think you're involved with them, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I met up with, with Martin and at least three others when they had their meeting in, in Brisbane uh, a couple of months ago, and um, someone actually showed me Loom, and we actually discussed which two bits were missing to actually make it work. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, sure. Anyway, I'm not a Python freak, but I know what the problem is, and, and the Bazaar team also understands what the problem is. Uh, it's just a matter of someone spending, probably on the Bazaar end, or someone who knows about Python and Bazaar, spending one or two hours on it, and that would make me very, very happy. So if you're willing to have a look at that, that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Um, so what would happen then uh, for everybody else, um, if we were to use Loom rather than Quilt, um, but with the same technique on the patches, is every patch would be, um, would be applied individually, and then all the patches would be merged in what's called an octopus merge. Rather than doing a two-way merge or a three-way merge, it does like an eight-way or a 20-way merge. Um, and then it doesn't need as much context because it knows exactly what it's doing. The merge algorithms are smarter than uh, patches. Patch is actually a very, very dumb, simple program. So it would work much better, and we would probably remove pretty much all interdependencies between patches, and we would solve the... Um, issue that um, yeah, we lose context when upstream makes a change. So it could be all be shiny and pretty, it could all fall down in a pile of crying disaster, but it'd be good to try. <laughs> I'd love to try it because it looks like it might be better. So that's the, the story on that. Um, anyway, we've got that. Let's look at, at what the patches look like once you actually grab your bizarre tree. Um, so what you would do is you say bzr um, is clone, no, branch, um, lpr delta, and then your directory. What, what tends to work is if you do, do that in your home directory, r delta my branch. Yeah? You give it a name um, that contains, for instance, your name and what you're trying to accomplish with that particular branch. That grabs the entire um, tree. And that is really, really quick because it's only the patches to MySQL. It's not MySQL itself. You will want to grab MySQL itself as well. You grab that from the MySQL website or you grab it from, um, from Launchpad because um, MySQL, reside, MySQL Server resides at Launchpad as well. It's called either MySQL Server or Secular Server depending on which version you're dealing with. So I've already done this. You can see where I am, our Delta trunk. So that's a copy of the main branch that we have. And this is where the, um, the scripts are in bakery that actually put the distribution together that we, that we create. It's all there. You could recreate your own, um, your own our delta and fork our delta if you want, if you really, really feel like that. Um, and then there's the MySQL subdirectory, like that. And there's a 5.0 and 5.1. We'll look at 5.0. And which one might be useful to look at? I think we look at the Google one, and I think the flush show query logs might actually be particularly interesting. I'll basically run you through the patch process of one particular um, one, one particular patch. So within 5.0, we subdivide in the source of that particular patch, like CPAN, orders it in, in terms of authors, and then we have a name for that particular patch. Inside that directory, sometimes we have a bit of documentation. That's basically the, the raw source code of what we later put on the website. 
but the website is further developed. So once it's on the website, that's actually obsolete and should be removed. And here's the patch. Now, what do we see there? Um, whoops. There we go. Okay. First of all, um, and I sometimes move it manually, there's a, an info file. That's part of the patch infrastructure that we use. There's a command called show patches inside the MySQL server. That is a patch in itself. And it runs a script during the build of MySQL. And um, it reads this information, puts it in a little structure so that we can actually type show patches inside MySQL. That looks like crap, of course. Um, backslash G, see, there you go. You get all the information about which patches have actually been applied to this particular version. It doesn't functionally make a difference, but it's very good to actually know what changes you have in there. Okay. Oh, that's nice. Um, okay, where was I? There, I believe. Okay, so in this case, it's the flush query log. It was ori originally written by someone at Google, and it was slightly fixed because he was doing something weird in the wrong place. Um, which I happen to know. I'm, I'm, I'm no better a patcher than Google is, definitely not. So what, what did they do in this case? Um, you can say flush logs in MySQL, but that cycles all the logs, including the binary log, which is used for replication. Um, and that means that if you flush logs frequently, you will actually create lots of little binary logs, which just come, becomes a little bit annoying um, depending on your infrastructure. In the case of Google, they actually replicate those binary logs onto slaves um, in its original form. That's bin log mirroring. It's one of the patches we have as well. So not only affects the server, it actually affects the slave as well for, for file names and offsets. So it creates a bit of a mess. So it's purely a visual thing, but, but it helps DBAs be sane to actually have a separate flush slow query log. So we want to add that command to the MySQL server. So what do we need to do? In this case, there's a list of um, flush something, which is a refresh macro list, and they, they each contain a unique number. We can actually look at MySQL.com. Let's go there. Um, where is it? Include, okay. Six, seven. That's not what I meant. There we go. Um, so that's the full list. And let's see, what are we actually doing in the patch? After master, we're adding one there. So after that one, we're actually adding a new line. Yeah, that's essentially what the patch does. Uh, we need to make sure that it's clear in this space. So if you were making a new patch, you need to actually make sure that you're using a number that has not been used yet. And we're getting very close to actually having all the numbers used, and then you would need to make a more significant um, change in the server, obviously. So it needs a value. Um, why does so the flush slow query log need this value? Because there's actually an, a client side API command you can use for flushing, and that uses these values. So it actually, this patch actually affects the client library as well. And if you look in the documentation online, you will see there will be extra macros in your client side to do this. So from um, from a C client, you can actually now flush the slow query log this way. You could implement it without doing this, and it would just create the SQL command without having this internal API command as well. That would be, I don't know, an incom incomplete implementation. It's valid, but you would have to document it to make sure you don't confuse anyone. What else do we need to do? Well, we're affecting the parser, obviously, because we're adding we're adding a bit of syntax. We can now type flush slow query log. If you run that command on your server, it'll fail with the syntax error. It doesn't know about that syntax. So we want to add that. So we need to tell it about those symbols. And that's what we're doing here. Um, there's a bit of tweaking going on here. Some, um, for instance, log is already a keyword, but only in the sense that it's used as a function name. There's, of course, the, the mathematical log function. Function names in MySQL are not actually reserved words. The reason for that is that MySQL does not accept um, 
it doesn't it does accept this it doesn't accept this yeah so sql standard if you try this in postgres this will work this will not work in mysql it will insist that there is no space between a function name and the opening parentheses you can um there's a, a mode setting in mysql to make it accept this change so you could make it compatible with the ANSI standard but it's really really annoying because it would make all function names and you may know that mysql has a lot of functions state functions mathematical functions or string functions it has a lot of them it's very useful it would make all those names uh, reserved words which means you can't use them without quoting for um, table names database names column names that kind of stuff so it's good that it does it this way in my opinion but it means that um, we have to take care of the keyword so what we're doing now is adding the symbol and we're adding it in the um, symbols array and the symbols array um, is used for keywords that shouldn't become reserved words there's another array if you look at lex.h there's another array that will create reserved words and i won't go into detail now but if you look at lex.h the there's comment commentary above the array saying okay add things here um, for symbols that shouldn't be turned into reserved words and that shouldn't become reserved in the sense that you can't use them for a label in a stored procedure that's specifically the comment so we add the log symbol and we add the slow symbol because those symbols um, I think slow is new log is an existing keyword but it, it, it wasn't actually used in direct syntax yet it was a function so we need to add it here now and we need to remove it from the function list there so that's why I'm saying this is this one is slightly special in the sense that we need to move that particular statement what do we do in the parser um, that is not the parser I need to get I'll skip ahead a bit um, we'll get to the parser in a moment which is a yak based parser what actually happens during the query execution the the flush statements are actually managed in SQL parse.cc why the 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 logic inside the mysql server is often a case of you have to know or ask someone who does know or you just browse and grab until you find your stuff um, there's a hash our deltas channel on free node um, or ask someone whom you know um, has mucked around a little bit in the mysql server it's not brilliantly organized um, drizzle has been shuffling things through different source files for months now and they're they're starting to get to the point where they can actually find stuff um, there's lots of dead code in here there's there's lots of weird code in there there's got lots of code duplication in there um, there's 15 years of legacy bouncing around in here and actually some of the code is it goes back to the early 80s um, not my scroll being that old but the my isom the isom code base is older than that um, Jonathan comment you were sticking a hand up oh, okay um, so if if this option is set here um, then we actually call this is a um, this is a class and it has a method it's it's the slow query log class they are all derived um, from one log class um, and so it's a fairly straightforward forward patch really we've actually only added two lines of code there it is very very minimal which is why it's actually a nice example in our uh, hacking for dummies here's the parser what do we need to do in, in SQL yak.yy in the SQL directory? Most of the MySQL server, by the way, resides in the, dot, in the SQL subdirectory. If you look at it here, um, you will see uh, the protocol stuff. Um, Unireg is actually the early, early, 80s, early 80s leftover. There's the parser, um, the crypto functions, cursors. Um, items are anything that happens um, like addition subtraction functions all that kind of stuff here's sql stuff triggers udfs um, unions views updates it's all there um, but for instance if you're looking for information schema you have to look in sql underscore show dot cc because it's actually a hack on the original show commands you just have to know can't help you there or I can help you there you just ask me I don't know how to find everything but I'm pretty good at finding stuff through a couple of years of practice um, I used to hack around a tiny little bit in the server while I was at MySQL so I've got a little bit of history plus I used to have to make sense of the patches that I got 
while, um, while writing documentation. Anyway, so we're in the parser now. That slow symbol that we added earlier also needs to be added here. So there's, a li there's an alphabetical list of, um, of keywords, that, of symbols, underscore sim, that were defined before in the lex.h, uh, lex and we put them here as well. Then, you'll see some grammar later, and we have some extra labels, and we add this in the list of labels. I'm pretty sure that this entire list of labels can disappear because it's for an older version of Bison. However, it's there now, so we're kind of keeping it clean just in case. It's not up to me to remove that whole thing. It's not up to our Delta to provide code cleanup. Only if it affects, only if it's a bug will we do that. Um, in case of Drizzle, I mentioned this to the Drizzle team, and I think they might have removed it from their particular code tree. So Drizzle is the take a shovel and get the dirt out thing. This is purely a fix the little things that we want to fix, but don't touch the, don't touch the rest kind of thing. Otherwise, the patches get too big, the conflicts would increase then, and that means that any new version of MySQL will cause us so much work that it essentially becomes a four. So we don't want that. So here we get that label that we just defined, and we say log uh, or logs, which means that when we use there, there's the real new grammar, slow sim after flushing. So this is the flush command. Um, uh, well, after you specify the flush command, there's a couple of extra options to the flush command. And those options to the flush command can be separated with a comma. So you have one option and then another option, or just a flush option without anything else. And after that, you have to specify which log file um, needs to be flushed. So it could either be flush logs, flush status, flush slave, uh, flush resources. Um, that's actually another patch. Um, and so on, and there's a couple of extra options. So we wanted to say flush um, slow query log. So we're saying flush slow query, and then log or logs. So that's why we have this particular macro. We say you can say flush slow query log or flush slow query logs to be in sync with other grammar inside the, the SQL server. So just make it nice to use. Um, and if that's the case, we set this flag, the one that we defined earlier. And then during execution, that gets checked. It is that simple. Um, how do you work this one out? Five minutes? Yep. Um, so how did we work this one out? Well, in this case, it was done with Google. I could have probably come up with this one, um, and so can you. You would look at the management for one of the other log files, and you just cut and paste and adapt from there. That's a good way to actually learn. Um, I'm not a super fan of cut and pasting, but in case of MySQL, it prevents you from breaking things. Um, things may not look perfect always, but if they work in one place, doing the same thing in another place is probably going to be okay. It's kind of on that level. Um, so here we need to list the symbol again to make sure it doesn't become a keyword in store procedures. And the same for the slow symbol. So you see you need to add things in various places. And those were also patches that I needed to make because the original Google patch didn't include them, which means that um, the word slow was suddenly a reserved word. And that means that if one, someone had, would have had, um, installed the Adelta build into a system that had, for instance, a table named slow, it would have suddenly broken that query. Queries affecting that, that table, even a select, would have chucked a syntax error, high reserved words can't actually work out what I'm doing with this query. Um, so sometimes patches need a little bit, of, little bit of cleanup and they require a little bit of knowledge and, and experience with how the MySQL server works. Anyway, that gives you a bit of an overview how, um, how a basic patch works. Um, what we then do, and this will be the last thing I can show you. Oh, hang on, we were already in the tree there, weren't we? Um, what was it again? Applied. Okay. Okay, I can't show it to you in detail now. Apparently, I haven't set it up, and it takes longer than a couple of minutes to do this. Um, I will show you the basic trick. It is documented. Yes, there. Um, there's a readme in the root of the directory, which I've set up. So what I do, 
you create a branch and you grab a MySQL tree as well. This is just a basic source tarball from the MySQL website rather than the bizarre tree, but it really doesn't matter. Then I create an environment variable which points into the um, MySQL source tree. I go into the MySQL source tree and then say to Quilt, set up to do patches, but point to my patch directory. So I have two separate directories from my home directory and the one points to the other. And after that time, I can just say Quilt push and it will push the first, um, the first patch and I'll just show you what that file looks like. That's the one. It can contain comments and that's a patch and that's a patch and that's a patch. And every time you say Quilt push, it will just apply the next one, which is a, a set of files. And what Quilt will actually do, it will copy the original files to a separate directory so that it can actually recover them without unpatching um, and then apply the patch. And if it fails, it can actually recover as well. So it, it works like a stack. If you want to work on, for instance, this patch, you just apply it up to that point, change it. Then you say Quilt refresh and it actually updates this patch in the original location. It, it actually, essentially, Quilt is just a, a script that wraps around um, patch and, um, and diff. And it is just very, very, very handy. It's a bit crude in some ways. In some cases, it sucks a couple of warnings, but it does work just fine. Um, again, it would be nicer with Loom because it's all integrated in Bazaar, but this works. Um, it's, it's known to work. We were using something else before, and, and Quilt just works better. Um, if you want to just apply them all, you say Quilt, um, quilt push dash A, and it just applies the whole thing all the way to the way. But I'd need to uh, run the other commands to make that work, so I won't do that now. Um, building MySQL is a bit more finicky, um, but hang on. Um, I don't think that's listed here. Um, there's lots of blog entries online that tell you how to, how to build from a source tree, but at the basic level, what you do is you go to the MySQL directory there. Um, there is a build subdirectory there, and you have pl lots of scripts. And the best way to do it is usually, mm, for instance, um, this compiles for any Pentium, and this even works after recent versions will work even on a Mac Intel. Um, any, any Pentium based machine with debugging, to extra debugging stuff and no Berkeley DB, well that's old stuff, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so that gives you a basic debug compile. The one thing I have to mention is that if you're starting to play with plugins, which we're not covering now, no time, um, if you're playing with plugins, make absolutely sure that the plugins are built with the same debugging setting. If you're switching on debugging in the server, make sure your debugging is switched on in the plugins, otherwise the thing goes poof. Okay? Um, it'll go poof in, in new and novel ways. You will not actually recognize that it is the debugging. Big problem. Not good. Um, there are changes going on in the build process that will make it detectable. So uh, just be careful with that. I tend to build without debugging quite a lot um, because I just find it cleaner and plugins tend to not have the debugging stuff. Anyway, just be careful with that. Um, if you do need any help with any of this, one of the things... Um, you can do, of course, is just join the, um, hang on, that one. Um, just join the, um, the Delta developer mailing list. We're a friendly, friendly bunch. Um, many, many of the people involved there are not heavy guru patchers of, of MySQL. They just help out a little bit, and they may well be at the same level as you might be. Um, well, they will have been at the same level a couple of months back from you, and they're quite willing to help you. Um, and I'm not a, a guru um, MySQL hacker myself. I do have a C programming background, so I know what I'm reading, but I haven't written complete databases. I've, I've done low-level stuff, but I haven't complete, written complete databases. So I know what's going on, but um, I'm, not, I'm not a Drizzle hacker, okay? Nor a MySQL hacker as, as such. Um, any questions? I think we're out of time. Are we out of time? Excellent. Questions? I need to stay seated here. No one? No one? Who wants to have a look at, at our Delta after hearing this and willing to have a, have a peek at the code? What, what kind of, yeah? What, what kind of things would you like to, to add? What kind of areas are you interested in, in looking at? What, what, what would you like to tweak? What's the objective? 
Yep. So enhancing that or a new instrumentation on top of that? Actually, okay, that's good. Yeah, sure, yeah. This is a good thing. The, the good thing, I think, and that's another reason why we're keeping things as patches, it makes it more manageable, but also it's easier for you to get started because you can actually look at a very discrete change in the MySQL server in a single file. Yeah, that file contains those changes for the MySQL server. You can see what gets changed where. And you can learn from that. So that's a very good place to start, which is why I call this server hacking for dummies. It is really the good place to start. Um, Monty, um, he's doing a boat, boat trip uh, today with David and, and the families, but um, he does things like a tour of the MySQL source code, which is brilliant, but it doesn't actually get you closer to being able to hack the server, because now you have a grand overview of where the source code is, but you're not able to actually tweak things in the right places. Patches do that. Um, of course, if you're trying to patch something that hasn't been touched before, you need to ask questions. Yes? I, I should probably, hang on, let me. I know there was something missing. <laughs> um, obviously, some of the patches have been commented from your earlier talks, like the instrumentation stuff. Is there any standards that the group has sort of form, informally put together saying, you know, we need a minimum of this to say what your patch does? No. Um, before actually putting the patch in, I will demand that there's su sufficient documentation, raw documentation for me to be able to write the documentation on the website. Um, I used to be, yeah, like the tech writer for the MySQL manual. So I'm, I just need the raw information, but I can often read the patch and see what it does, and I can work from there. But it should be in some way clear. You add a little text file. Um, in terms of, for instance, other, c we could talk coding standard. Very simple. MySQL has a coding standard, which is in some cases weird. It puts parentheses in, or, or um, the, the curly brackets, it puts them in funny places in some cases, or places that you might not be used to. It does make sense to find stuff really effectively inside the database server. Um, it also has funny issues with ifs. An if doesn't have a space after it, but a while statement does, if I'm not mistaken. And there's a reason for that. but. Anyway, I don't question it. Essentially, what you should do when you do a patch is you just blend in with the code around it, and that tends to work out okay. Um, yes, it also makes, well, stand out. <laughs> um, the point is that potentially some of those patches may actually end up in the main code base. And if they don't follow the coding standard, that makes that process much more painful. So our delta is not opposed to getting stuff in the main code base. There's nothing wrong with that. The point is that it takes a very long time and a considerable amount of effort sometimes on the patching party actually submitting that. Um, you need to sign the, the, um, the licensing agreement and, and, and so on and actually uh, essentially submit your code and pass over the copyright to, to Sun so they can do a license it. Um, all that would be fine, but um, because no pla patches are applied to stable versions of MySQL, if you submit a patch now, it will be applied into MySQL version 6. Well, 5.1 has just gone stable. When is, five, uh, when is 6 going to be production? A couple of years from now. So if you now get a patch applied, it doesn't apply to you now. But what could happen is that an R Delta patch also gets accepted into the code base. Um, and that means that we have it as a patch now, but in version 6 it's already implemented. So when it becomes production, we just rip out the patch from our delta and it just is built in. But it means that we do, we should actually have that basis of documentation so people know which changes are in our delta. Because when you're running in a delta binary, you need to know what instrumentation is in place, what changes in behavior, if anything, is there, what commands you have, what command line options, uh, what configuration options, and that kind of stuff you're dealing with. Um, and what output you get. And also, um, yeah, for the coding standards, it's good to just have that same coding standard so things are as readable as the rest of the code. It doesn't really matter. This is the same as with SQL formatting. It doesn't really matter or, or with schema naming, column naming. It doesn't really matter what coding standard you use as long as you use something that's consistent. So as soon as we have the whole server to deal with, we're just doing it the same way. Um, no sense in arguing. I mean, <laughs> it may not be perfect, but it works. 
Last question, perhaps? And I'm, I'm here all week, so I'd be happy to answer any question you might have. If you need your, um, your LCA Rubik's Cube solved, I can do that as well without picking it apart. Yes? I do this from memory. I'd have to check, and the person who would actually have the answer to the question is not here at the moment. That would be Monty. I don't know. Does Stuart know? Was I right? Well, there is that, but... <laughs> yeah, there is that. Okay. No, never mind then. Anyway, thank you all very much.